plan is, uh, so we're going to work on the simulator some today. Then we're going to, we're going to add a couple more things to it. Uh, let me just get this loading. No, that's not it. This is it. here because we do not have class next week uh, I'll be out of town so what I'll probably do is not give you a big assignment over that instead I'll just have you push ahead a little bit on the reading for two weeks from now because um, I assume some of you might be going out of town as well but you know just to keep us on track because I want to get into <sighs> just close this here just kind of think of where things are going. We talked about logical operations last time. Um, we talked about, did we actually talk about the instructions for making decisions? We didn't actually talk about, but you've read these, so we'll, we will look at those. That's for branching instructions. Um, we probably will talk today some about uh, procedures. That's somewhere in here, yeah. Um, Yeah, because where I want to go next, we've talked about some of the arithmetic uh, stuff as well. We've done um, addition. We haven't necessarily done subtraction with uh, binary, but it's very similar. Um, we've talked about multiplication at the high level, so I do want to talk about some of this stuff. This will probably be right after um, break. Uh, and I want to talk about some of the parallelism stuff here in contrast with We have parallel processing here somewhere. Oh, that's probably under the CPU. Yeah, processor. Because then I want to start getting into the processor from a, uh, a lower level perspective, not just, you know, it's this collection of magic trick stuff, but actually thinking how uh, data paths work and pipelining and things like that. Um, and I want to spend some time talking about um, parallelism for instructions. So we're talking about instructions at the high level right now, and then we want to kind of go into the complexity of our modern processors. If we roll back to, um, you know, 30 years ago, processors were actually pretty easy to create instruction sets for relative to today, because today we have processors that have two cores or four cores, and we're having to decide when two instructions can happen at the same time, where or is one reliant on another one because something's going to go into our register, something like that. So uh, we want to spend some time talking about the parallelism stuff. Uh, I will probably skip some of the other things in processors, and we want to talk about, uh, but I'll talk about that, that the stuff in processors along with this parallel processor stuff, but I won't talk about all of this. Um, but this stuff is going to be a lot more about what our modern processors is like, and then I also want to talk about memory hierarchy. So that's kind of the stuff I want to get into on the the second eight weeks, um, let's say. So, and then we'll intermingle uh, concepts into our simulator as we kind of stumble upon them. And we'll kind of keep this thing going as a, um, an ongoing exercise. All right, so we were supposed to do add and add immediate, correct? All right, let's see where I left this off because I think we just have a, uh, an interface with some registers. Okay, so we would enter in our ARM code here. We'd hit run. Um, in here, we can load things into registers initially, uh, and then we have to have a way of kind of saving that. I think I mentioned maybe using a, um, uh, a singleton uh, last time. Okay. Uh, and then we have uh, this idea of what RAM um, We'll let, yeah, we're not using it yet, but uh, that's kind of where we're going to start talking about stacks and heaps and, and kind of how that stuff is going to end up working. 
All right, because that's part of the simulator. I think we were mimicking this off of the simulator in uh, uh, the book. Okay, so let's get our registers storing first. So we've just put in uh, a total of eight registers here. That's fine. Um, so then maybe what we'll do is we want to go ahead and have like a, maybe a save button or something like that on the screen that whatever the current state of this is, you hit save and it does what it's going to do. Okay, so let's go in here. All right, so I showed you, this is our singleton from last time, this thing called core. Uh, and this guy might hold the current value in X zero. Um, what I might do here just for, um, since our registers are numbered, uh, what I might do is I might just create an array of values, bucket zero, bucket one, bucket two, that kind of stuff. So X zero re is relative to uh, bucket zero. So rather than having each individual register um, there, is that, uh, that going to be a good idea? Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking down the road if that's if having, that's yeah, not going to hurt anything. So we'll say static. Um, we will hold it. I guess we can hold them as, inter well, we can hold them as strings, but we could also hold them as integers and then convert them out. But strings will give us, that's Java, strings will work. So we'll say static string array. And we'll call this guy registers. And he's going to be a new string array. And right now we only have eight. We'll adjust that if we add some more registers, but eight should be enough for a little simulator thingy. Okay, so we're going to have uh, that in there initially. Um, we probably want to go ahead and initialize this to, its, to, to the original value. So I think kind of put zeros and everything. So what we'll do is on our... Do we want to do one on register activity? Because register activity doesn't actually launch until the other ones do. Because one thing we, we could run into an issue with is if we are back on this screen and registers haven't already been set up, if we do some arm code here. Yeah, so we probably want to actually initialize them uh, at the beginning. So we'll do this in main activity. Uh, and actually what I'll do is We'll just, we'll give a function to core. So we'll say static void initialize registers. All right, and what this guy will do is it'll spin through registers and uh, um, set them all to the string zero. All right, so um, for Listen, registers.length, I++. Plus plus. And we could talk about registers as a local variable here because these are both coming from a static context. So, um, you know, technically I'm saying core.registers.length there. Um, oh, it's all capital. Core.registers.length. But since I'm in the class core and I'm also in a static uh, context, I don't need the core dot portion there and we'll just say registers at bucket i is equal to a zero like that okay so now we're at the singleton level we have our registers all filled up with some zeros and then what we want to do is we want to have when our register activity first launches so this on create, we want to go ahead and we're going to give ourselves access to all of the little text boxes and we'll go ahead and fill it in with those things. Okay. Um, now, one thing we want to check here real quick. I'm just going to do a system.out.println here. And let me fix the couple of other errors we have sitting here with our I think we're good. So we want to look in our register activity on create. This is part of the life cycle of a, um, uh, an activity. The very first time we come in here, we should see here get printed out. If we hit back and then come back in, we want to see if this code gets hit again or not. This will tell us how the life cycle works. 
that you think it gets hit a second time. Yeah. All right, so I'll go into registers. So there's the first time, wherever it hit, here. Now I'll go back, and I'll go back in. So, yep, so it gets hit, it gets hit both times. Okay. So, we need to consider, um, I guess when you're hitting back, it's getting memory collected anyway. So, we'll always just load in the most re recent version of our registers in here. So, this on create gets called every single time we click our button to load, load onto the screen. So, we need to go ahead and we need to give ourselves access to our registers. So, inside here, what do we name these guys? That's X0 ET, X1 ET, X all the way up to X7 ET. All right. So let's give ourselves access to those guys. Private edit text, X0 ET. Um, oh, I guess we can do that and then fill them in. So this will be an edit text array called the registers. And then down here, we can say this dot the registers is equal to a new edit text array. Uh, we happen to know there'll be eight things in there. Right, and then we'll go ahead and say this dot the registers at bucket zero is equal to the edit text version of this dot find view by id r dot id dot x zero et like that and then do the same thing seven more times and it'll be one two three four five six seven two three four five six Seven. This is X one, X two, X three, X four, X five, X six, X seven. All right. So we filled up all of our um, registers there. Uh, now, what we might want to do is we might want to go ahead and maybe in core. Um, eh. Yeah, I was gonna. I was deciding whether to put a function in core for filling it up, but I think since this is the only screen that fills it, we'll just we'll do it in our code here. So we'll here in register activity. Yeah, these are the actual um, registers. We don't set text yet. These are these are those guys. So now what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna grab our. Uh, registers from we're going to go through all the registers that are in our singleton and load these guys into it and it should be the exact same size so actually something that would be good programming practice here to do would be a static int number of registers and set that as an eight there and then here in register activity, rather than saying eight, we would say core dot number of registers. So that if we changed it, it would change everywhere. Okay. Uh, and then inside of core, we would do the same thing. This guy would be in terms of number of registers. So registers there and uh, the registers here will have the identical size, so it doesn't matter which one we spin through down here. So we'll go ahead and fill our registers visually from core. So we'll say for, I'm going to, I'll do a for loop. Print i is equal to zero, i is less than. 
core dot number of registers i plus plus each time through we want to set the current register we're looking at in the registers text to be equal to the value associated with the register in core so we'll say this dot the registers at bucket i dot set text equal to core dot registers at bucket i that'll put the value in there all right right now they should be all zeros but we'll modify that here in a second and make sure it looks the way we want it to look all right so let's run this guy uh, those should be we named them all correctly at first we're going to run this again they should still be all zeros right now with no crashes um, did we not fill it out here i didn't call initialize did i So in our main activity, we want to go ahead and say core dot initialize registers. So it fills it up with zeros. And now we should see zeros in there. So there's our zeros. All right, showing the current state of our registers. Okay, now when you're gonna, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put a, a save button in here that will go through and update core with the current state of these guys. So let's see, that's this guy here. Okay, so how are these laid out? That's just a vertical linear layout, so I should be able to put a, a big button beneath it. Oh, that's weird. A button went in. See, it's still in the, cons the constraint layout. Not good enough. We'll throw a save button up there. All right, so that's save. And then we want that guy to go ahead and call our function. So let's write a function on register activity. This would be public void save button pressed UV. All right, and what we want to do with this is we want to go through and update all of our registers in core. So we're going to do something pretty similar to what we did here. So go through all of our local registers and we can assume that they're putting legal values into them and copy them over what's in core. So rather than sit there and try to decide what's actually changed, we'll just overwrite whatever's uh, in core with the current version of the values. All right, so we're gonna set core dot registers at bucket I equal to this dot the registers at bucket I dot get text dot to string. Make sense? So we'll copy into our singleton at the equivalent register, the one that lives at bucket I, we'll give it whatever the re local register's edit text has in it, the string version of that guy, and throw it in that global register. Okay. Um, now, the save button doesn't have to take us back to the other page if we don't want it to. We could just say, I want to save and just make sure we've, uh, we've saved. Uh, and then maybe what we want to do is after this is done, just to give us uh, feedback, maybe we could do a quick toast, just to say value saved or something like that. Um, so we'll say uh, toast, well, well, that should work, dot make text. And make text is to be this. And then we have to give it the message. We'll just say saved like that. 
and then we give it the duration. This is toast dot short is fine. Uh, do I have to give anything, anything else? Nope, that's it. And then we do dot show, and that'll post it on the screen. Okay. Kind of a handy little thing you can do with a singleton. Uh, I won't necessarily do it right now, but if we start toasting all over the place as we um, build this up, we might want to go ahead and go into, uh, um, oh, actually that would, I don't think that would work. I was going to say we could throw this in core and we can have a toast here that takes in a message. You could do it. You could have a toast here that takes in a message and the context, and then it goes ahead and toasts it, puts it on that screen given that context. The easier thing would have been if you could just store a context in here, but co as context change, the screens that you will be toasting on will change. So you don't want to store uh, main activities context. And then on register activity, try to toast based on main activities context, and then the toast shows up on a screen you're not looking at. Does that make sense? So you could give yourself a little shortcut method here. Given a message and giving a context, it'll toast on your current screen. And that'll keep you from having to, you know, write like all of this uh, with toast that length short and then show. Not the end of the world, but it would shorten things a little bit. All right, so that'll tell us that it is saved. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll test this. So we'll go in there, change something, save, go back, go back in. It should be updated. Just making sure our registers have good values. I wonder where Van is tonight. I was really expecting more broken English than that. We can still give him a hard time even if he's not here. Okay. Oh, by the way, I did see that um, I think a couple of you have already signed up for the hackathon. That is April 14th, right? So hackathon, this is April 14th from um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner will be provided. Uh, you need to email. Joshua.Locklear. Um, and in that email, uh, tell him that you're going to attend and also let him know your preference. VR slash AR or mobile app because we're going to have teams working on both. So you'll get put onto teams that are doing something that you're interested in. If you're interested in doing virtual reality uh, stuff, whether you've done it at all before or not, um, they'll put you on a team where you can learn. If you'd rather do a mobile app stuff, whether it's iPhone or Android, they'll put you on a team related to that as well. Um, my classes are required to do this. If you're not able to show up uh, that day, I'll give you an alternate assignment. But uh, this should be a Saturday, April 14th. So if you haven't already signed up, there's signs around here. There's one back there you can read about it. But uh, um, email Josh Locklear, letting him know that you'll be there. Be there. Mark it in your calendar. Request off work. Whatever. Blah blah blah. Sound good? All right. Then uh, pick right here. Yep. Well, in CS here. So we'll have a bunch of VR helmets. We also will be doing. Uh, we'll have some mixed reality helmets uh, this time. Uh, which actually doesn't really change the way you develop for it, but um, um, yeah. So, and we'll probably also be doing the VR in a different way because VRTK project got shut down. Yeah. So, um, uh, Steam, yeah, they they pushed a final version, so it's still there, but they're not no more support. But they no more updates. Uh, they ran out of funding, I guess. So uh, we'll have a. Um, uh, I'll do another boot camp, maybe the Monday before the hackathon or something like that, 
showing you the new way of <laughs> of uh, doing interaction that's independent of which headset you're working with. Um, because now we have the mixed reality ones. If you've never played with those, they're actually pretty pretty cool. They uh, don't require the sensors. So you uh, you have the headset. And um, in fact, maybe uh, at some point today, we'll we'll dive in there for 20 minutes. I'll just give you, uh, we'll do a quick demo because you can you use Windows in VR. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, and they have a thing now where you can actually use, play Steam games and stuff like that from from there. But the headset's a lot less expensive, right? So, you know, the cheapest way to get into VR through Oculus or Vive, Oculus is like 400 bucks, um, but it also requires you to have a pretty hefty computer, where with mixed reality, um, the headset with the hand controls is like 225 bucks. And um, if you want to play, you know, the high-end games on Steam, you're going to need a pretty good graphics hardware. But to uh, do kind of the... Uh, productivity VR stuff that Microsoft is pushing. I mean, you need to have a decent computer, but nothing earth shattering. It'll run on much less hardware. Um, so, you know, maybe some of the older laptops it's still not going to work on, but you, uh, it doesn't require a, a, a $2,000 computer to, to drive mixed reality. So yeah, maybe one of our breaks, if we start getting tired of doing whatever we're doing, we'll take 20 minutes and go play in VR or something like that. I was already telling him I'm, I'm just exhausted today. I took a nap too this afternoon. Slept for two hours. I don't know why. I think I maybe I'm go. I leave for my trip tomorrow afternoon, and maybe I'm. It's like a twelve hour drive. So maybe I'm just oh, dreading the. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just doing something. Like I was too. I was too tired to go in the hot tub. <laughs> I, I chose to go and lay down and sleep. <laughs> So if we need to revert to playing some team virtual reality games, that's what, that's what we'll do. All right. So everybody has the information here for the hackathon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll probably send them out a, further ahead of time this time. So we'll, we'll send out the teams and we'll send out the topics so the teams can start like thinking about what they want to build. Um, but just like last time, it'll be um, about learning. You know, so, you know, you'll be put on a team. Um, so, for instance, several of you have done some VR stuff. So, if you choose VR, um, we'll probably put you on a team where you might be, you know, one of the leaders on the team for VR stuff or with one other person who's done some VR stuff. Um, if you've never done VR before but you're interested in VR, then we would put you on a team that has one or two people that are experienced in VR so you can learn uh, how to do the, the VR stuff. Um, but we'll probably have a common kind of topic where build an app that meets some criteria and then people can choose to do that in a mobile application. So Android or iPhone or in virtual reality versus or augmented reality because we will have the, the HoloLens as well that we can set up. Um, but uh, I don't remember, did the team do the HoloLens? Yeah, the team did do HoloLens last time too. But I don't know. Which will you guys pick? Will you pick VR or will you pick mobile? What did we say back there? VR. You'll pick VR. So you'd rather do Android stuff than VR stuff? Yeah. Huh? For, for, what do you think, Evan? Mobile? Oh, so you're on the fence. You have to pick VR. VR? I have no clue what I should Well, do. you've never programmed in VR before, right? And not much in mobile. But you're messing around with mobile here. Yeah. So getting a crash course in VR, I think, would be okay. pretty cool. Have you, have you done anything in VR? Mm -mm. I've used it. And like, what have you done in VR, like, using it? Like, I'm, like, going to buildings and, like, yeah. the IT has just set up this part and um, just mess around with some of the games. Then we had, like, Okay, so you like Robo Recall? Yeah, yeah. So you played Robo Recall? Yeah. Okay, yep. Okay, so let's uh, bounce back here. So we've done our hackathon plug. Uh, where are we at? I ran this, right? So now we just need to test our button. No, we don't have to test our button because we have to set this up. Um, so we have to tell our button to call the save button press thing. 
that's this dude, that's this dude. Here's his on click, save button pressed. So now when we click that button, it should go into here, spin through all of our registers, setting our singleton registers equal to whatever the current ones say. And then we'll toast that says save. Then we should be able to go back and come back in and see those changes have taken effect. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go into registers. We're in here. Uh, I'll just change, I'll change this register to a five. And I'll change this one to a nine. And then I'll hit save. It says saved. So now I'll go ahead and hit back. We'll go back in and there's our five and our nine. So it is saving globally uh, now. Okay, so we have our registers. So now we'll go back. Uh, we're not doing anything with RAM yet. That's just where we're going. So ARM code, we might do something like um, add and we might say something like X zero. Um, actually we, for this, if we were doing, um, uh, we, we're doing add, right? Yeah, so we do add and add immediate. That's the homework assignment. So we'll add X zero and add in, this takes three, right? So the resulting location would be X zero. We can add X one, X two. So it'll take X one plus X two, storing the result in X zero, okay? Um, otherwise we could do something like uh, add immediate for that. That'll store in X zero, the sum of X one and the immediate value three. All right, those are the two things we need to support, okay? So now let's program up this run button and at least figure out what they're asking us to do because we need to parse this command, correct? Okay. So let's give ourselves. <clears throat> okay, we already have the on run button clicked. Did we actually hook that up? I'm going to close this and I'm going to close this just to clean this up up here a little bit so run already has the on click okay so we need to first parse our expression um uh, that's fine yeah so i think any assumption you make is fine i mean commas are part of the syntax so i think our validation should be they should they should give us we can assume they gave us legal ARM instructions. So I don't think we need to validate um, whether or not they gave us a syntax error. We can assume they gave us valid ARM instructions and then parse it based on that. You know, we could always throw a uh, something on top later on that kind of goes through and checks to make sure that what they've given us meets the, you know, the regular expression requirement of uh, that. But yeah, so you can parse it on commas is, is the, I think the, what you're asking, right? Okay, so we'll go back in here, in here. Okay, so first we wanna go ahead and get our command. So we're gonna read in from our button or from our edit text and we do not currently have the edit text supported in here. So we need to get this guy, it's called input ET. So we need to bring that into our code so we can extract the value that was thrown in there. Uh, so I'll go ahead and make that global up here. So private edit text input et and then in here we'll go ahead and say this dot input et is equal to the edit text version of this dot find view by id r dot id dot input et okay And then we'll go ahead and we'll get the um, instruction. So we'll say string instruction is equal to this dot input et dot get text dot to string. Okay. Um, and just, just it'll only take a couple of seconds. Let's just do a system dot out dot print land. 
instruction and just make sure that we're transferring stuff from the edit text into here and able to spit it out before we start parsing. All right, so I'll run this. All right, we'll just say, I can just put whatever in there and hit run. Go to log cap. Yep, so we're reading that in. That looks good. Okay, so first thing we need to do is we need to figure out, so let's use all the, the, the things, that, the correct things that the book uses, so like your op code and stuff like that. So we'll go to our instructions section. This is in the second thing where they're showing you the size of the thing and the op codes. Where did they? We had that in here, didn't we? This one. Did... No, I just wanted to match their what they call the different things. So we have our op code, which is the operation, and then I wanted to match the destination, what like what whatever they called that. We were looking at it last time, so it's like. Uh, Two point two and two point four. Oh. Oh, so it shows it in here. No, that's not what I was looking for. It was the one that showed us the breakdown where we had the 11 bits, 5 bits, 5 bits, 5 bits. That's 2.5. Oh, representing instructions in the computer. That makes some sense. All right. All right, so yeah, this is what I want. Op code, so they called op code, and then we have So this is the op code. What are these three guys called? What's the book calling X1, X2, and X3 there? What's RN and RT? So this is a register, this is a register. Ah. The source operand. So it's the shift amount. It's the first register. Okay, so RD. So for R's, the destination will be RD. And then RN and RM are the other registers. We don't have a shift amount right now, so we're going to have op code, RM, RN, RD. Those are going to be our four pieces. All 
Okay. So I'm just going to create strings for those. So we're going to say opcode rd rm rn. All right. They're going to hold all of our stuff. All right. So our instruction will look something like um, add space. It's x, oh, x0, comma, x1, comma, x2, something like that. This guy should come in for opcode. This guy should come in for rd. This guy should come in for uh, rm. This guy should come in for rn. Actually, I think they have those flip-flopped. So I think rn is the first and rm is the second. Rn is the first, Rm is the second. All right, so those would be the variables we read them into. All right, so what we need to do is we need to grab the opcode and then grab everything after the opcode. This we can parse on commas, right? So we need to get this first piece. So how do we get just the opcode? Um, okay. Well, but that's then we're validating it, right? I don't think we have to validate it. We can assume they're giving us illegal input. So assuming that we have something here, how do we extract just the add part? Okay. Now, if we split on spaces, what will we have? We'll have this, then we would have this, then we'll have this, and then we'll have this. Yeah, but we're substring to where? Add immediate is four, add is three. I want this to work for either of them. So I want to be able to get my opcode. Can we ask, can we figure out where the first space is? Then get the substring up to the first space? All right. So. Let's say get opcode. So we'll have a int loc of first space. How do I get the location of the first space? Index of. So I'll say instruction dot index of space. So that'll show me, that'll give me in this particular case, this is zero, one, two, it'll give me the three, the location where that guy lives. All right, so then I'll go ahead and say opcode is equal to, um, what do they call it, instruction dot substring from zero to loc of first space. And then I'll go ahead and do a dot trim on it just in case they had some extra spaces uh, at the beginning, something like that. So then we should have just our, 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 our operation, right? Okay. Then I want to get everything after that. So we'll go ahead and say string rest is equal to instruction dot substring. And we're going to go from location of first space all the way to instruction dot length. And we'll trim that. Um, I gave it to a, I gave it to arguments. Yeah. Oh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. This will go all the way to the end. I'm pretty sure there's a version of substring that'll go all the way to the end, which does what I just had to do. All right, so this gives me everything from this point to the rest. And I'll trim that. I don't know if we needed to trim it, but that'll get an extra space off the front. We're going to do more trimming as we go through here. All right. So then we want to go ahead and we want to um, split this guy on commas. Okay. So we can do this a couple different ways. We can use, is there a split in Java? All right. Um, so we can split on a regular expression or we can also use string tokenizer um, to do this. So we'll do 
um, this is going to give me a string array. So we'll call this guy string array parts is equal to rest dot split and we're going to split on commas. Okay. So that should then give us the three parts, which is going to be x0, x1, x2 uh, with some spaces. All right. So then we'll go ahead and we know that our destination, rd, is equal to parts at bucket zero dot trim. rn is equal to parts at bucket one dot trim. RM is equal to parts at bucket two dot trim. All right. Now, again, this assumes that they put in legal code. We're not doing any validation about, you know, how legal their, their instruction is. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and print this out and just make sure the things are showing up the way they should be showing. So we'll do system out dot print lin. Um, we'll do op code. RD, RN, RM. Let's make sure we have the pieces correct. I'm going to go ahead and steal this guy. And just for testing, I'm going to go into my activity main and I'm going to set the text on this dude to that. Just so I don't have to type it each time, I'll just hit run for testing. All right, let's see that we are properly extracting this guy. We did. We it's called it, we we use something called index of. Okay. I didn't yeah. Know that yeah. What that does is it returns the first the index of the first occurrence of the character you're looking for or the substring you're looking for in the string or a negative one if it's not found. So we said, show us the first occurrence of the space. Although this would break if they had leading spaces, right? If they had extra spaces in front, this would have, it would have broke. Um, so don't put leading spaces in the front. <laughs> right. Like you couldn't just look for, like, here's your string, what's over the interim, look for it equals um, add, looking for ADD. And if you find them, that's those things, then it, then it goes from there. Then it, you could do that, but then you'd have to do it for each of your instructions. Because your instructions have different lengths to them. We can uh, actually, here, real quick, we can fix that leading space issue. Yeah, we'll just, we don't remove, yeah, you could, you don't want to remove all the spaces because you want to keep that space between, and the, yeah, trim. You want to trim it. Yeah, so what we'll do here is we're going to go into um, main, and when we get our instruction up here, We'll trim that guy. That'll get any leading or trailing spaces off. So we're guaranteed that it's starting with whatever your instruction is. We should text Van, see where he's at tonight. Oh wait, hold on. I got a I got a text from him. Well he just might be late. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and run this. So we'll go ahead and hit run. We see that we got our opcode add, we got our um, RD, we got our RN, and we got our RM. Looks reasonable enough. Okay, so now we want to make a decision based on what opcode is, because that's the function that we're calling, and that's going to tell us what we should be expecting from that point forward. Um, realistically speaking, we probably would have made, wanted to make that decision after we saw add because some instructions are going to have other numbers of parameters or whatever. So we can go ahead and at least pretend like we did it the right way. We happen to know add was coming in. Um, so right here, we have the op code and we have everything else. Okay. So now we want to make some decisions based on what the op code, uh, what the op code is. So we'll say if op code dot equals, 
And we could say equals ignore case if we want to give them a little more flexibility for whether they want to type in add in all caps or lowercase or whatever. So if they gave us an add, then we're going to go ahead and do this stuff. So we'll get the parts, we'll split on commas. We're also going to do that same thing if we do an add i. Um, but at least this is the, the, the type. So we'd say if it equals add or if it equals add i. So if either of those is true, we're going to get these parts. Then we'll have to ask the question again to find out which math we should be doing. Um, but at the very least, this uh, gives us a... All right, so we know these things are working. So we don't need to print them out. All right, so now we'll ask the question if opcode was... Uh, actually, we don't need to add and add I will work the same. The difference will be whether or not we're getting the last piece from a register or from the immediate value. Um, okay. So then what we'll do here is, so the real question is, is whether or not RM holds an immediate or holds a register. Okay. All right, so we need to go ahead and we need to extract the value that currently lives in Rn. So we're going to look up the value from the register. All right, so why don't we call this guy, and that's going to be a, um, uh, the values that live in registers are always going to end up being integers, correct? So do we want to support them putting things into our registers in different bases, or are they always going to put it in in decimal? Just decimal? Okay. So we'll go ahead and say um, int val of um, Rn is going to be equal to, uh, and this guy's going to have the name of a register in it. So we need to pass that name uh, to core and have core hand us the value given that position. So what I'll do, I'm just going to end that verse real quick. We'll go into core and we're going to write a little function up here, static int. get value um well we could we'd have to split it on the uh because right now we have x zero so we'd have to index we have to get the zero part of it the second piece so you could do that i think this lookup is going to make more sense for how things actually would work under the under the hood so get value of register and this guy will take in a register name as a parameter. And then we're going to spin through our uh, um, uh, we'll have this guy actually do the split, I guess, because of the way we stored this. Let me I'm going to write something up here because I wanted to match kind of how these things would work. So I'm going to call this register names. All right. And this guy is going to be X zero comma X one, X two, X three, X four, X five, X six, X seven. Okay, so that's the name of all those. And then I'm going to actually refactor this guy. 
I'm going to rename him to be register values. And that should have also then changed that value in our register activity. So now it's called uh, register values here. So by refactoring, I change it throughout the whole program. All right, so back in core. So now these two map up to each other. So I'm going to find the position in register names of the register name I'm looking for and then grab the value associated with that from register values. All right, so we'll say for So for each reg name in register values, oh, it's not for each of this, it's just for. Um, oh. And then this guy down here will say if reg name dot equals ignore case register name that we're looking for. If that's the case, oh, this breaks it for us anyways. I don't want to do a for each loop because I need to have the index. Print i is equal to zero. i is less than register names dot length. i plus plus. So then we'll say if register name dot equals ignore case register names at bucket i if that's the register we're looking for then we want to go ahead and return register values at position i and if we're going to have this guy return an int then we'll have this guy return integer dot parse int of register values at position i that'll give me the integer version of that. And then we'll break out of our loop. Actually, we don't need to break out because we just returned. Um, down here, if we're still kicking here, because it wants us to return an int, uh, so we'd have to decide what we want to return. We want to return a negative one? And that's, that's technically a value that could live in one of our red uh, you can't really check it because a negative one could be the value that lives in the register. Yeah, we're, we're returning the value of the register here. So we're getting the value of a register given this register name. Um, so. Um, we can do that. I just don't. Let's see if we can return minus one. Yeah. yeah. Then we're separating the two. So now, so that's called coupling. So the other part of the program that needs to know where to look up the register, where really the name of this function is, hey, I want the value given the register name. I guess for us here, since we know if we're assuming the code is always going to be correct, um, we can put a return here that we know is never going to get hit. So we can say return negative one, and then we can say should never be hit or something like that. Uh, otherwise, I guess we could, um, have a runtime exception. Throw runtime exception register not found like that. Here, catch all. So 
If we're still if we're still kicking here, we'll throw a runtime exception. But the register was not found. All right, so now we can go ahead and get the value of our register given a register name, and we're not going to be picky about case. We'll come back in here. So value of our n is equal to core dot get value of register. We'll pass it our n. Okay. Um, now we only want to get the value of RM if it's actually a register. So if we're dealing with a, um, uh, a add, then we know that RM is a register. Correct? We could make this even generic though. If they didn't give us a register name, then it must be a immediate. So we could do a try catch. A runtime exception, you can't try a runtime exception. Can you? Actually, you can. I'm going to try to say val of, I'm going to give myself an int val of rm. So we'll say val of rm is equal to core dot get value of register rm. And then we will catch the exception. And if there's an exception there, then value or val of rm will be equal to integer dot parse int of rm. So we'll try to look up this guy on a register, but if it was an immediate, we're not going to find a, a register with that name. So we will have an exception that gets thrown. We'll catch that exception and instead set val of rm equal to the value of that immediate. I think that should work. So we can catch a runtime exception. Um, so let's put a little comment before that. RM might be an immediate. So try to look up the register and fall back on parsing the immediate value. All right, so that's what that guy's doing. It's either going to get the real value of the register if RM was a register or it's going to give me the integer version of RM, which would have been the immediate value. Oh, 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 yeah, it's not just a direct, it's not a direct value. So integer.parsent won't work for it. Well, but it'll work, so it's always, we're still good here. We just have to write it a little different. We can't just directly integer that percent. So it always looks like what? Uh, hash sign followed by the number. So we just have to peel off the first character. All right. So we already have trims in there, so we don't have any extra spaces. So we'll just say rm.substring1. Give me bucket one on. That'll peel off the... The, uh, the hash, hash symbol. Parse the numeric component of immediate, something like that. So our value will look like that 23, something like that. So we just want the 23, get the number of that. Okay, so that should give us the values then. And now we will, so we have all the pieces we need and our storage is always going to be, um, the is always gonna be a register. So now we want to write a function in core, static 
void set value. Um, maybe we make this guy Boolean. Set value of register. And this guy will take register name and a Um, let's actually have it take in an int value and we'll have this guy turn it into a string since we're storing strings. All right, so we'll steal a pretty similar thing here. So we'll go through all of our register names looking for a name that matches. As soon as we find one that matches, we will say register values at bucket i is equal to the string version of value. And then we'll say return true. If we're still kicking here, return false, they gave us a bad register name or something like that. All right, so set value of register, it's gonna take in the, the register name we're trying to set, and then the value we're trying to set it to. We'll spin through all of our register names. As soon as we find the register matching uh, the name case insensitively, Ins insensitively, then we will set the value of that guy equal to the string version of our value and we'll return true that we did in fact set the value. Otherwise, if we go all the way through here and never return, we'll return false, value was not set. So now we have a function for setting the value of our register. Okay, so where am I at here? Main activity. All right, so regardless here, I know I'm performing an add. The question is, is whether or not my uh, val of RM is a, the value that was stored in a register or was stored in an immediate value, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say core.set value of register, what register, whatever stored in RD, and what's the value? It's going to be rn, or sorry, value of rn plus val of rm. The sum of those two values. And we're storing it there. Okay. And then after this guy has completed, we can do another little toast here. We can do it outside of our, ah, we'll do it here, I guess. So we'll say toast dot make text. And this guy takes in a context. So that's going to be this. It takes in a string. So we're going to say um, opcode concatenated with complete. And then a toast dot length short and then dot show so this code right here will do either our add immediate or our add and then when it's done it'll say I've completed whatever the op code was and then we'll know that we can then go look at our registers and see the updated register values Okay, and we'll run, add was complete, go to register, so we expect, well actually we, uh, we expect a big fat zero to be in there, right? So everything's still going to be zero. We're adding x1 and x2, so let's change this guy to a 5, this guy to a 10, we'll save, we'll go back, run this again, so now we should have a 15 in x0. There's my 15 in x0. Um, we'll leave it. So we'll just we'll leave it like this for right now. We'll go back in here. We're going to change this guy to an add immediate. And instead of x2, we're going to put dollar sign 100 or something like that. 
that should give us a 105 at x0. So it said add i complete. Go to registers, and there's my 105. All right, so is that complete what we had to do for the homework? All right, so what would be other things that we could put in? So if we go in here, and we'll, we'll take a break in a few minutes. I just want to do our simple, simple cases here. So where's our list of instructions? We're not obviously going to implement all instructions, but we can do the other mathy runs like sub and uh, sub i. Well, let me just get those instructions up so we have our list because then we want to start thinking about the memory stuff or the ability to load stuff into registers, right, from a command. So uh, let's see. Which thing has our list of instructions? Maybe here? It wasn't in 2.5? There's like a big list somewhere. I think this is going to be good enough for us. So we have sub and we have sub i. So these guys are going to be pretty similar to what we just did. All right. So if we do sub, we're storing into x1. Is it x2 minus x3 or is it x3 minus x2? It's 2 minus 3. So this is rn minus rm, right? Okay. So let's make this work for um, sub and uh, sub i. So we're going to do this exact same stuff, whether it's add, add i, or sub or sub i. All right, but the math we'll do at the end is gonna be a little bit different. All right, so all this stuff should be the same up to this point right here, right? We either have immediates or we don't have immediates. We, so we have all the right kinds of values. Now we need to ask the question, um, whether or not we're dealing with an add or whether or not we're dealing with a subtract. All right, so how can I, at, at this point, do I care if it's an immediate or a normal, if it's an add immediate or an add subtract, or I'm sorry, an add immediate or a normal add or a sub immediate or a sub or a normal sub? No. no. So how do I detect if I'm dealing with an add of any type versus a sub of any type? Okay, but I want to I want to ask it. I don't want to say if it's an add or an add I do this. I want to ask it just directly. Am I doing some kind of addition? How do I ask generically of the opcode? Am I doing some kind of addition? Yeah, you you mentioned kind of contains or something like that. So we can say if opcode dot does it have a contains contains a character sequence so we'll pass this guy um here just to cover our butts here i'm going to see opcode dot two uppercase dot contains add then do addition stuff That way we're still being case insensitive. Else, we must be doing subtraction. That makes sense? So whatever our opcode is, we're gonna convert that to uppercase, just in case it wasn't already uppercase. Then we're gonna ask, does it contain the word add? If it does, that means it's either an add or an add i. So we'll go ahead and do the addy stuff. We don't care if it's an add or an add i because value of rm will be correctly set. Because the, our, 
little magical try-catch trick here. Else it must be a subtract in our current world. So we'll set it to the subtraction version. Okay, so now our guy supports subtraction as well. Go into our registers. I'll set this guy to five. We'll set this guy to 10. I'll save. We'll go back. Uh, we already saw the ads worked, so we'll say sub x0, x1, x2. So this should be five minus 10, giving us a negative five inside of x0. So we'll run that, go to registers, there's our negative five. We wanna do a sub immediate. There we'll do minus 25. So five minus 25 should give me a negative 20. And it said sub I complete. There's my registers, there's my negative 20. All right, so mathy stuff works pretty well. All right, so let's take uh, 10 minutes-ish. Take about 10 minutes, we'll come back and then we're gonna do loads. So let's get the stuff loaded into registers, okay? Oh no, loading in stores for loading into registers and, and reading out of registers. All right.